You're all here, I guess, because you have an interest in this, or perhaps you've been told to come by one of your professors, I don't know, but if I was given this talk at uh, Massey Hall or at a medical round somewhere, I could make the point, I think pretty comfortably, that um, you all know someone who, who's been touched in some way by this issue, whether it's um, someone who uses drugs or someone with pain who's been helped or by opioids or harmed by opioids. Um, it, it, if you think you don't know someone, it's probably just because they've kept it secret. This is a very pervasive problem. Um, and whether you know someone, whether you think you know someone, uh, you, you, I'm, I'm pretty sure you do. I, it's, it goes by a variety of different names. I don't think it matters what we call it, honestly. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that there really are two constituencies here. There, there are people with pain and people who use drugs. And this issue, of course, touches on both of them. And I think we need to acknowledge, and this is sometimes a, a concept that's resisted, we need to acknowledge that these things are occasionally overlapping. Um, I want to talk about these two things separately. Now, I'm not a pain physician, and I'm not an addiction doc, but I look after patients with pain and with addiction all the time. And I've been doing this for now about 20 years. Um, no one will debate the idea that pain is a problem, a, a huge problem at a societal level. I mean, it's, the, it's probably the commonest complaint that doctors see. Um, I was on this stage exactly seven days ago, and I was sitting up here, sitting right about here, and it was for the graduation of the um, postgraduate med trainees, the, the internists and the cardiologists and the nephrologists and whatnot, and they were all in the front rows and their families in the, in the back. And it occurred to me that, uh, that the way that they approach the treatment of pain or the way they view opioids as a tool for pain is very different than how I viewed it 20 years ago when I was exactly at their stage. I finished internal medicine in 98. And in fact, as I was a pharmacist actually from 1990 to 1995 in Nova Scotia. And I can tell you with a fair bit of confidence that when someone came to the pharmacy with a prescription for morphine, it was because they had cancer. We did not have people on morphine or things stronger than morphine because of a bad back or because of a bad hip or, or what have you. Um, so they, I, I mean, I've watched this happen firsthand. They, they practice, uh, these are a little bit dated now, but they practice in a time when opioids are just everywhere. They're just the thing you use for patients with pain. When someone comes to the hospital with pain, it's almost like a knee-jerk reflex that we give them an opioid because of how we view it. It's, there's been a real culture shift in medical practice. And what's happening here? All right. I think it's important to understand, and, and Nicole talked about this at the outset, that the, the reason why we use opioids the way we do, or the reason why there are so many prescriptions out there, is because of messaging that we got in the mid to late 1990s. And this was I think mostly well-intentioned. Nobody, as a medical student in 1992, I had no problem ordering morphine for somebody with cancer. I had no problem ordering morphine if someone's femur was sticking through their thigh. But, um, but in, the, in the late 90s, we began to prescribe very often drugs like morphine and oxycodone for chronic pain, a much bigger market. And this push came from a variety of different areas. And I think it was a well-intentioned push because, I mean, frankly, there was a huge unmet need. We, we didn't have, and we still don't have a lot of good drugs for pain, and it was very often that we'd see people in chronic pain, and we didn't want to touch them with anti-inflammatories because of how incredibly toxic they can be. So I guess the point I want to make is that this, I think, mostly well-intentioned push to use opioids had behind it a lot of pharmaceutical money. And I single out Purdue in particular, not because they're the only company, but because they're the manufacturer of OxyContin. This is a privately held company in uh, Stamford, Connecticut. The family that owns it is now, I think, the 16th or maybe 19th wealthiest family in the US, largely on the basis of the sale of pain medicine. But uh, in 2007, in the US, Purdue Pharma became a felon. And three of its senior executives became, they pleaded guilty to misdemeanors. They didn't go to jail, of course, because you go to jail for selling weed um, in the US. Uh, the, but they, Purdue acknowledged in this settlement, they acknowledged, uh, they pleaded, pleaded guilty of something called misbranding. They acknowledged misleading doctors on a whole host of fronts about the safety of opioids long term, about the effectiveness of opioids long term, about the risk of addiction with drugs like OxyContin. The whole idea with OxyContin was because it released over 12 hours, at least in theory, over 12 hours, that you, you wouldn't get a rapid hit of the drug 
And that's what, I hate the term addicts, but an addict didn't want that. They wanted something that released quickly. Well, it didn't take very long after Oxy was launched to the FDA to say, do not crush the OxyContin because all the drug will be released suddenly. And of course, people of course began to use it because, because they could. I want to show you this video clip. It's only about 30 seconds long. Um, this is part of a promotional, yeah, thanks very much. Right there, that's right. It's part of a promotional video. Um, it's called I Got My Life Back, but this is a clip of a doctor, a pain specialist in the U.S. There's no question that our best, strongest pain medicines are the opioids, but these are the same drugs that have a reputation for causing addiction and other terrible things. Now, in fact, the rate of addiction amongst pain patients who are treated by doctors is much less than 1%. They don't wear out, they go on working, they do not have serious medical side effects. And so these drugs, which I repeat, are our best, strongest pain medications, should be used much more than they are for patients in pain. So I don't, this is uh, Dr. Alan Spanos, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars he took over the years from companies like Purdue to spread this message. I, I'm sure he believed what he said, but it's important that you understand that nothing he just told you is based on actual medical data. It was speculative, and as a freshly minted internist in 1998, I was happy to hear it. Um, because I went, like most doctors, I went to medical school. You, know, if you went back to my medical school interview in 1990, and you said, so why do you want to be a doctor? Everybody gives the same answer. I want to help people. And so we are conditioned by nature to want to relieve suffering. And because the most common form of suffering we see is pain, we often, we, we, we often we want to help people. We want to give not just them relief, but we want to have the, give the impression of having taken some action. Um, David Sackett is the, the father of evidence-based medicine. He died in 2015. I had the good fortune to meet him a couple of times. This is a quote of his. But I think it's, it's important to know that the students who graduated a, a week ago tonight um, believe what they believe because the medical community, and I'll just be blunt about this, we have been brainwashed into thinking that opioids are a good therapy for chronic pain. I'm not going to say that they don't help some people, but the messaging we got over the last 20 years was simply not true. It was founded on anecdotes and, and wishful thinking. Um, now, there's not a lot of benefit in looking in the rearview mirror except to understand that the way we view opioids today um, isn't based on much. Let's, let's talk about how we might address this going forward. And Hans, Hans probably does a, as good a job of this as anyone. I mean, we, there are many different things that one can use to treat pain depending on the patient and depending on the nature of pain. And drugs are just one thing. Uh, but to tell somebody that they need to exercise or lose weight, I mean, it's easy to say, but it's hard to do. And people want pain gone now, right? Who among us hasn't gone to the medicine cabinet for some acetaminophen or some ibuprofen? Because nobody, it's a very aversive thing. We want pain gone. Um, but drug plans will pay for your pills. I mean, your insurance plan might not pay for a cognitive behavioral therapist. These are all things that we, I think, need to use more readily. And I, I think it's easy to say this, uh, but it has to be said, we need a massive societal investment in pain care. And if we don't have that, we are going to continue to rely on opioids and other analgesic pills that help some people and don't help others. So if I was talking, and I've done this more than once, talk to doctors about how we should go about prescribing opioids, reasonable people can disagree on this. I think Hans and I, for the most part, agree. Um, uh, I think it is fair to say we and I still use opioids for acute pain and for end of life pain. And I use them for chronic pain too. But I do so a lot more thoughtfully than I did just 10 years ago and certainly more than 15 years ago. I think we need to start them less readily than we did. We need to view the initiation of an opioid as a, a bit of a risky experiment, honestly. Uh, and I can defend that in the question period if you like. I think it is wrong to go to a de for a dentist after sending a 17-year-old home after wisdom tooth extraction to give them 60 Percocet tablets. Unless the dentist took the mandible off, I mean, I don't think you need 60 tablets. And Hans commented upon uh, pharmacies restricting prescriptions. I think it's totally fine to st restrict the initial prescription, not the ongoing one. But you know, a lot of initial prescriptions don't get taken. They sit in a shelf. Uh, and so I think uh, restricting the initial supply to five or seven days uh, is actually not uh, that wrong. But I think the one thing, if I could pick one thing that we have historically done that we have to stop doing, it's this progressive escalation to high doses. Um, and I'll talk about, I think, just in a moment why that is so dangerous. So there are some barriers, of course, when some pointy-headed academic like me comes up and says, well, we have to do this and that. There are all kinds of barriers 
to changing how we prescribe. One is the fact that it's an entrenched practice. The residents just did it. They do it because they saw people like me do it, um, and it's just something we do. Uh, there are, um, there's the expectation. I mean, we work in a system that doesn't really optimize pain management, and we, are in, we have these perverse incentives to use opioids for reasons of fee-for-service, and you've got eight patients in the waiting room, and you've got to get onto them. Um, we, we, there, there, are, there are a whole host of reasons why this is going to be hard to change. One of them is opposition from special interests. And you might raise your hand if you think the NRA is a powerful organization in the U.S. It's okay, it's a rhetorical question. What if I told you that opioid manufacturers outspent the NRA eightfold over the last decade to counter messages? Um, to counter maneuvers to try and curtail opiate prescribing. I mean, why do you think they did that? I'll just let that hang there. Um, I wrote this piece, uh, I guess, a year or so ago. Yeah, just a, almost a year ago. Um, because I think, and this is probably the most contentious aspect for me um, of managing uh, using opioids, it's, it's the patient with chronic pain. Um, and I'll just say again that I do prescribe opioids for chronic pain. I don't think they have no place. But it, it's um, the patient on opioids for chronic pain who sees themselves as what we'll call a legitimate pain patient. They don't display outward features of aberrant use. They just do what their doctor told them. They're taking their pills every 12 hours or applying their patch every two or three days. And they are functioning. They're doing things they couldn't do beforehand. And I grant you that there are people out there that opioids can help. But I think it is fair to make the point that the higher the dose goes, the less likely it is that we are doing what we actually want to do. So if I had some, this is a routine question on the wards with me, the medical student says, I got a patient with pain, I want to use opioids, and I say, what, what are you trying to do? Um, and he or she would say, well, I'm trying to relieve their pain. I said, okay, well, think for a moment, what are you really trying to do? And they'll think for a bit, and you can see them cogitate, and they'll say, well, I'm trying to um, improve their suffering, help their function. And I said, that's, that's a better answer. But if you accept the fact that all drugs we might use for pain have potential benefits, and all drugs we might use for pain have potential harms, answer the question now. And then they will say, well, I guess I'm trying to afford the patient more benefit than harm, right? If you knew that the ibuprofen you take on a Sunday morning for your hangover was going to cause you to have a perforated ulcer, you wouldn't take it even if you knew it was going to take your headache away, right? So I uh, believe that opiates can do exactly this. But as time goes on, you heard Hans talk about this a moment ago. As time goes on, what very often happens is they lose their effectiveness. There's a phenomenon called tolerance. And we were taught that when you saw that, when the guy in OxyContin 10 twice a day, his pain relief isn't quite as good at month one or two, go to 20 twice a day, and then go to 40 twice a day, and go to 80. And they once, at, for a period of at least a year, had a 160 milligram OxyContin tablet on the market. I have, I have looked after people taking the equivalent of 3,000 milligrams of morphine a day prescribed by a chronic pain specialist. And as the dose goes up, all of the side effects go up as well. And the problem with the side effects of opioids is they're not as visible sometimes as stomach ulcers and kidney problems and heart failure that you can get with prescription anti-inflammatories or liver failure you can get with acetaminophen. Um, and I bristle a bit, and I, I, I'll take issue maybe gently with Hans's talk about addiction and overdoses. I mean, those are, of course, visible and extreme consequences of opioid therapy. But think of all the other things that can happen to someone as a direct consequence of the drugs. And so if you accept the fact that the side effects are dose dependent, it is very easy to be in a situation at 500 or 1,000 milligrams of morphine a day where the patient is experiencing side effects. They don't even blame on the drug. They blame the depression and the pain. They blame the sleep apnea on being overweight. They, they blame the infection and the fact that people get infections. They, they might not appreciate that the pain is partly from the medication in some people. So it's very easy to be in a situation like this, especially at high doses, where we have, with the best of intentions, upended the primary goal of therapeutics, which is to help the patient more than harming them with drugs. Um, and this is something that does not sit very well with some physicians and some patients in the chronic pain community. I understand that. Um, I guess I would make the point that as much as I think being on high doses is a bad idea, I think it's a much worse idea to yank these out from people, yank them out underneath them. The last thing you want to do is take somebody on a dose of 500 and say, sorry, the new guideline, I was on the steering committee of the new guideline. The new guideline says 90, we have to cut you back to 90. That's malpractice. People die because of that. 
and we, we have to stop doing that, and doctors have to read the guideline, not read the Globe and Mail version of the guideline. Now, let me talk a bit about addiction. Now, Matt, um, Matt knows a lot more about this topic than I do, and I agree with a lot of what he said. He made a lot of very valuable points. Anyone know who this is? You have to be over 30 to know who this is. Oh, come on. I, I, look, I, you're over 30, I can tell. This is James Taylor, all right? So James Taylor, fire and rain, come on. So I'm, I'm going to see him uh, in uh, Massachusetts next week, actually, at Tanglewood. So this is from 1968. This is the cover of his first album. And James Taylor uh, was an active heroin user in, in London at the time. And uh, I'm a big fan of his. He's now 70. Um, I would wager that if James Taylor was a 20-year-old heroin user today, there's an awfully good chance that he wouldn't live to age 70. Um, you heard about the skyrocketing rate of death. I mean, these are mostly not people who are uh, using opiates for chronic pain. The vast majority of these are people who use drugs and they are dying in huge numbers for a variety of reasons. This is, this is the poisoning crisis that Matt spoke of, but a lot of it has to do with fentanyl and dozens and dozens of different analogs of fentanyl that are everywhere in our drug supply. So this is, this is diacetylmorphine or heroin. This is oxycodone. Um, I, I put, I don't, I, you probably didn't expect chemical structures when you came here, but I want to make a point. Um, these are opiates. Um, you, can, you, you don't need a degree in chemistry to appreciate the similarities between oxycodone or morphine or codeine or hydromorphone and heroin. This is fentanyl, okay? So you might get it from a doctor in a hospital by IV or as a patch or in the States, incredibly, as a spray. Um, or you might get it in a powder that came from China. And the point here is that you can, as, as Matt said nicely, you can make this in a lab. You can't make heroin a lab, in a lab without a great deal of difficulty. Fentanyl, you can make by the ton, and you can make a lot of money. Um, let, the reason people are dying in such large numbers is because um, of the, the toxicity of the drug supply and the fact that we don't treat them as we treat people who have other drug use disorders. And I'll come to that in a minute. Let's talk for a second, in fact, about what doesn't work. What doesn't work is pouring millions of dollars into border security or the idea that a wall, a wall that Trump will never have, a wall between U.S. and Mexico is going to stop this problem. That's insane. You can pack a million doses of this stuff into something the size of a shoebox. You can pick thousands, tens of thousands of doses into something the size of a baseball. It is impossible to prevent this from coming into the country and spending money on that when you could be spending it on looking after people is just wrongheaded. Um, but you sometimes hear it said, and in fact, I think you can't hear it said enough, that we can't arrest our way out of this crisis. Um, I wrote a, uh, a piece this April with a friend of mine, an addiction and public health doc in uh, Edmonton named Akeek Varani, uh, making the case, just as the liberals were going to their national meeting, uh, making the case for decriminalizing drugs. And I think it's important to, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go over time a little bit, Richard says it's okay, so I'm going to listen to him. Um, uh, I might not have thought about this this way 10 or 15. I have to admit. I mean, I've been thinking about this from different angles over the last 10 plus years. Um, but uh, it, drug use, people who use drugs have, in, in many ways, a health problem. Uh, it's a criminal problem because we made it one. But drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes are really fundamentally no different than injecting heroin. Um, and if you kind of are shocked by that, I mean, it's, maybe it's because one of those things is illegal and one of them's not. Uh, and so think of, all the, think of all the time and money and resources we invest as a society in arresting people and incarcerating them and putting them through the judicial system and yada, yada, yada. And all of that money could be spent helping them not die today from a drug supply that is just so incredibly toxic. Putting people in jail, you know, making it criminal causes people to hide their drug use. And this is why people die in Tim Horton's bathrooms and, and, and parks and parking, you know, in their basements and stuff like that. You know, in contrast, Portugal in 2001 said, you know what, we've had enough of this. They changed their laws. And in Portugal, if you um, are caught with a small amount of drugs for personal use, you're given the offer of help. You're not put in jail. And you can tell people about your drug use without fear of a criminal record and all the negative things that go with a criminal record. And in Portugal, about six per million people die of overdoses. And in Canada, it's 110 per million. Um, wouldn't it be great if someone who, was, who had a, an opiate use disorder or whatever you want to call it, addiction, opiate use disorder, a person who used drugs and said, you know what, I, uh, I would like to not do this anymore. I'd like some help. Wouldn't it be great if they had access to people who knew what they were doing 
and knew how to manage addiction. Now, wouldn't it be great if they had access to things, liberal access to things, that weren't laced with fentanyl or carfentanil or any of the other fentanyl cousins that are out there, including, by the way, prescription heroin. I mean, there are multiple randomized trials showing us the utility of this. And I mean, I, I'm still I'm impressed that doctors will sometimes raise an eyebrow at the idea. I mean, uh, you know what's not in prescription dimorphine? Fentanyl. Uh, and people don't die when they use this stuff under supervision. Um, this is Insight uh, in, in Vancouver, um, a place where people can go and use drugs. It's similar to the Moss Park site. But the whole idea is, is this is harm reduction 101. If you happen to overdose, you're cared for by somebody who knows what they're doing um, and can bring you back. And you know, maybe you have 20 overdoses before you decide that you want to make a change. I, uh, uh, this is not something I know a lot about. Matt can talk about more of it later. But I mean, this is, this is just common sense. Um, and it's not just a safe place to use. I mean, there's a sense of community. You heard about this. There are clean needles and swabs. So things like skin infections and endocarditis and the, the, the transmission of hepatitis B, uh, B, hepatitis C, sorry, and uh, HIV. I mean, from a purely financial, societal sense, these things pay for themselves. Um, and the idea that, that people resist them in some communities just blows my mind. It's, it's, a, it's a moralizing, stagnant approach to a, to a serious public health problem. Naloxone is the antidote that um, Matt will have given plenty of times. Uh, the people don't feel very happy afterwards, but they're not dead. Uh, it's a, it's a, this is a Band-Aid but it's one hell of a Band-Aid. I mean, this literally takes someone from on the verge of death to breathing, uh, which is what they need. So um, my time is up. I, I guess I want to make the point that uh, this is a crisis of how we manage pain, and it is a crisis of addiction and poisoning, and there's an intersection of those two things. Um, and I think we need to, we, we really need a massive investment from a societal level in both pain management and the care of people who use drugs. And without those things, if we try and just fix one problem by constricting prescription count, uh, counts, I mean, that, that, that is dumb. Uh, we need to do a whole lot of things together um, to try and solve this. And it's going to require a lot more than just people talking in a theater. It's going to require action uh, on the part of the people who are charged with, with looking after public health, our, our, our um, not just our mayors and our premiers, but our chief medical officers of health. I mean, th that's what they are for. Um, and with that, I, I'm, I'm hopeful if we do those things, we can help people stop losing their friends and their children. Thanks very much.